Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to say a couple things right up front. I am not here in my role as a journalist. Uh, if I were a journalist, I'd have to ask a whole bunch of questions about a whole bunch of topics. Uh, I'm here as a father of two little boys that are going to have to grow up in this country. Uh, I'm here as a concerned citizen, and I'm here as uh, the president of, of the Dream Corps. We work on criminal justice. I've been working on it for 30 years. We have a short period of time to talk, and we have some of the best brains in the country to talk about one of the most important issues, which is prison reform. Uh, I want to start with you, Jared. Um, you have stepped out on this issue in a way that has been uh, surprising, inspirational. Uh, what are you doing, and why are you doing it? So uh, thank you, Van, and first of all, thank you for being here and for all of your advocacy and leadership on this issue. It's been uh, great working together on it, and without your help, we wouldn't have been able to make the pro progress that we have, so thank you. Uh, I also want to thank a lot of the people in this room who really have been some of the great advocates uh, for the work uh, from around the country. I really am inspired by all of the work that you do, and you are making big difference for a lot of people, a lot of families, as Hannah so eloquently laid out earlier. And what I'm finding is that you've given a lot of hope to the people who say that uh, we can't change the recidivism rates, we can't change this. I see uh, in all of your programs and all the work you do that we really can make a big difference, and we are committed to doing it. So thank you to all of you today. Um, to, to Van's question, and I will be quick, so I know we have a short time, uh, this was not an issue that, uh, that was part of the campaign. And um, one of the reasons that I was excited about uh, this president was I saw that he had the potential to be a president for all Americans. And, because he didn't come from a traditional uh, governing or government background, uh, I saw the president as somebody who would take on all different issues that would impact all different people. Uh, this is an issue that I had personal experience with, so I spent some time thinking about, well, from the, from the, from the White House, what can be done? And so we started doing uh, the way that you know, we would look at problems in business. We said, okay, let's assess the problem. Uh, let's come up with a plan to try to drive solutions, and then let's you know, come to a vigorous execution phase. Uh, what I found is that there's a lot of people in this government who are very, very passionate about this issue and really want to drive change, and I think we've started doing that, and I think we have a lot more uh, effort that's going to be able to come. Uh, one of the things we had to do, though, is take it to the president. Obviously, this has to be the president's initiative, or else we wouldn't be able to be working on it here. And so we gathered a bunch of, uh, of, of experts to meet with the president and explain to him you know, the situation with 650,000 people leaving prison every year, how a lot of these people will become future criminals with victims and often how the people leaving prison are more disadvantaged than when they got into prison, and it makes them more likely to commit future offenses than it is for them to uh, have opportunities and, and to live a second chance once they've uh, paid their debt to society. Uh, the president's response was really remarkable. Uh, he looked at it, one of the people in the room said to the president, they said, well, you know, you campaigned that you were gonna work for the forgotten men and women of this country, and there's nobody more forgotten or underrepresented than the people in prison. And I could see right then the president said, that's right, we got to do something about this. And since then, he's been all in to push this initiative and, and has really empowered his team and led his team to try and drive uh, solutions. So we've been working in the, the federal level. Uh, we're working on the state level with a lot of the great governors who are here today and with a lot of you who are really you know, in the field uh, doing great work. So uh, that's how we got here. That's why we're doing it. And uh, we believe we can make a lot of progress. What are some of the things that you're focused on making happen. I know that you've got a lot of activity going on. People may be uh, uh, just curious, what are you moving forward? Sure. So uh, the first thing we're doing is we're, we're focused on the people. We're saying, how do we take as many people in this country who, uh, for whatever reason, you know, they, they've committed crimes or they're in prison, and how do we help them have the best chance uh, of, of of, uh, of, of living a productive life after. So uh, the first thing we did is we spoke to a lot of the people, a lot of the people are in this room today, and what we uh, saw is that it has to be a holistic solution, right? So if you just help somebody get a job or if you just help somebody with uh, addiction or, or whatever it is, it, it's a less likely uh, of achieving the right outcome than if you do them all together. So we really want to make sure that we have all the best practices together. Another thing that uh, the Attorney General has been a great leader on is making sure that all the programs that we're working on are evidence-based. So. Uh, we're focused at the federal level where we only have 8% of the country's inmates, but uh, we're working on legislation in, in Congress now, which uh, just got out of the Judiciary Committee uh, 25 to 5 vote, which is very, very bipartisan for this climate, uh, which we are quite pleased with. Uh, then we're working on the Reentry Commission where uh, the new director of the Bureau of Prisons, uh, General Lynch, has been working with Attorney General Sessions to look at all the different changes they can make in the prisons 
And we're also working with all the faith community and all the different advocates throughout the country to try to go into the state and local prisons. The single biggest thing that we want to do is really define what the purpose of a prison is. I think that that's undefined right now in this country is the purpose to punish, is the purpose to warehouse, or is the purpose to rehabilitate. And our view is that a lot of the people who are in prison today, they will be getting out at some point. I think it's 95 plus percent. So we feel like we have a duty to try and help them, uh, you know, figure out how to make themselves better so that when they re-enter society, they have a higher probability of getting jobs and of, and of being productive citizens than they do of committing a future crime. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do. And there's a lot more to do, but trying to do it in a short time frame. Last question for you, and then we'll, we'll get, to, get to others. Um, why not do everything, though? I mean, you're, you're doing prison reform. Uh, some people say, why not do also criminal justice reform, sentencing reform? Why not uh, take on the whole uh, system? It seems like you're starting a little bit more narrowly. So uh, sentencing reform is something that people still have different opinions on. And um, what we've seen is that they've been trying to do that at the federal level for, I think, eight years. They've been trying to do sentencing reform and prison reform. And what they've done is nothing because they haven't been able to pass it through. And uh, there's a lot of really great people working on it, and I'm very appreciative of the efforts that they've made because without those efforts, we wouldn't be here today talking about this because they've started the dialogue and the discussion. And one of the great things about our democracy and the way the system works is that you have to keep debating, 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 and then when you can finally build consensus, that's when these things are supposed to become laws. And you know, people say the system's broken from the time that I've been here. I actually think the system works very well because you have to stick with it and win the argument and figure out how to build the coalition and consensus if you really want to change the laws of the land. And that's why we have the best system in the world in America's democracy. So, uh, what I assess just from coming into this, you know, having not been in politics before, I looked at everything uh, maybe with a clean slate, and my observation was that the reason why this thing was stuck was because of the sentencing reform. So uh, we, as an administration, said, let's focus on the prison reform. Uh, if we can start showing that we can make the prisons more purposeful and more effective at lowering the recidivism rate over time, uh, then that may uh, help the people who are trying to make the argument for the sentencing reform and make it uh, something that over time has the ability to go. So right now, I think that issue is still one that needs more debate, um, but, uh, but there's very strong arguments on both sides and a lot of good arguments that people make. Uh, but right now, I think there's a big consensus around the fact that we need to reform our prisons. And uh, if we get that done today, it will start helping people and their families today. And that's very important for us to do. So you know, we're not here to debate, we're here to do. And if we are able to move this forward, we will be doing things that will make our communities safer and that will impact a lot of people's lives and help their families and their communities. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to go, I want to go to you. Uh, uh, Topeka Sam is here. Uh, you've been a tremendous advocate for women behind bars. Uh, that is apparently a part of this push, trying to make things better for women. Why is that important? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. And thank you for all of you being here. Um, well, I first want to just lift up some of the women who are in the room, who are formerly incarcerated, who are advocates and activists, who are doing the work. So if you would either stand or just raise your hand, because I'd like you to be acknowledged, because it's a tremendous, tremendous feat every day after experiencing trauma to continue to use that trauma to change lives. Thank you. And see, you know, we all have experienced incarceration. Myself being incarcerated in federal prison for three years, I went in with privilege as an educated woman, a woman of color who had two parents who um, were franchise business owners, who went to college, and who made choices. And when I made those choices, I landed up with a, a conspiracy drug charge in federal prison. And when I did, what I saw was what happened to all the women that were impacted, not only by the system, systems that I even contributed to, but systems that people were put into based on poverty and race. And when we look at how we want to really change the system, we really need to start thinking about the people that are most impacted or directly affected. And those are people who are, are experiencing poverty in, this, in, in our country. Now, there are 80% of women who are incarcerated presently who are mothers. 86% of women have experienced sexual trauma, violence, or abuse, and that's just the ones that are actually reported, because everyone doesn't tell and share their stories, right? And then we think about the fact that there is 2.2 million people incarcerated, 4.6 million people who are on pretrial probation or federal supervision, and 70 million people 
in this country that presently have a criminal conviction. That's one in three adults, which means that it's not only the women who stood up and myself who have a criminal conviction or have been impacted by the system, there's a lot more people in this room. And so I think that it's important for all of us to look at what we've been, what we've been doing in this country. What, look at what's happening to our women and our mothers. Look at the things that happened for decades to come. And, you know, we don't care about whether or not, you know, it's, it's, it's bipartisan, it's, it's red and blue, it's, it's, it's black or white. You know, our people just want to be free. Well, what happens to women in prison? Women are, are victimized and traumatized over and over again. You know, we've experienced sexual violence and abuse and then we have to be subjected to having male guards watch us undress just because they want to. It's no threat. You know, we have to ask for pads or tampons when that is a natural thing that we have to go through, right? And then when we have to pay for them, we have to pay for them at the same amount that we do in the street, yet their jobs are only being paid for $5.25 a month. Women who have children have to decide whether or not they're going to call their children at home or buy toothpaste. And how do you expect the country, how do you expect the children not to be impacted in a way when this, these things are happening? I mean, you know, I'm a person that just gets graphic just to give details, and as a woman, myself, I had uterine fibroids, and I had to go through a myomectomy. And the fact that I had to quantify my cycle, which meant that I had to give a, a paper bag of soiled pads to a guard, a male guard, in order for him to see that I was actually using them so that he would issue more. And I had resources. I had family support. And you have to think of the hundreds of thousands of women who don't and how this impacts their children. And though, yes, we, we, it, when you think about public safety and you think about these things, you have to think about this is safety for everyone, every single person. And there are women who will die in prison, women like Alice Johnson who will die in prison if she doesn't receive clemency. First time nonviolent offenders. I, I um, have heard your story many times and I, I think you'd have to have a heart of stone not to be moved and I appreciate your great work. And you. Give her applause for her courage <laughs> in trying to bring this forward. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's tough, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your courage. Um, uh, Jessica Jackson has said about um, this issue that it's a, it's a one to one conversion when people hear some of the things that are happening with women behind bars, some of the stuff we could fix tomorrow and we should, so I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know whether they call you secretary, governor, or sir, but uh, <laughs> uh, most people don't think this is a fixable problem. Uh, uh, Rick Perry, is this, is this a fixable problem? based on your experience in Texas? Yeah, absolutely, and, and uh, Van, thank you for being here. Uh, this isn't a Democrat or a Republican issue. This is a, truly a bipartisan issue. And uh, Jared, I wanna say to you and to Ivanka, thank you both for taking this on because this, is, this may be the issue of our generation. Uh, and, and we're seeing places across the country, and I, I'm gonna take it a little step further, and I think you were absolutely correct in picking that uh, narrow, uh, victory in that narrow place to focus so, uh, so that we could put the, uh, the, the marker in the ground with a victory, and, and it was a resounding one. Uh, but what I think is the next obvious step, and it's the one that I share with the President, this is real conservatism, and that is criminal justice reform, and that is being able to uh, clearly make sure that people like you never get there, Topeka. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the real victory. Uh, yeah, you made some poor choices. You made a bad choice somewhere in your life, just like all of us have made. Uh, but what we were doing in the state of Texas, we were putting young people in prison for really long periods of time, Mary. Uh, you and Susanna, our neighboring states, and, and you all know what we were doing in the state of Texas. And it was a national issue. It, was, it started here in the White House back in the early 90s. Uh, with the, with the uh, uh, mandatory sentencing and the things that, by God, we're going to be hard on crime. And we were, but the result was that we were ruining a lot of lives, lives that we didn't have to ruin. And I had a Democrat district judge come to me in the early 2000s and said, hey, Perry, 
how about this? And talk to me about drug courts. And we passed that in the mid-2000s. Then we had prostitution courts, and we had veterans courts, and, and, and we made a real difference. And here was the result, Van, by 2013. In a, sh a relatively short period of time, like six, seven years, we had shut down two prisons and saved $3 billion in the state of Texas. But Secretary Wilkie, here's the more important thing. The lives that were saved. The lives of the people like Topeka that never went because we gave those judges the alternatives to sending them to prison with drug rehab programs, with shock probation, with other alternatives. That's real conservatism. That's what we're about in this country. And we can do this at the federal level. States can get out there, and, 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 I, and I know, Mary, you're looking at those kind of, of programs, and Susanna, you over in New Mexico, governors across the country. This is our moment as a country to send a powerful message to the least being able to help themselves in this country. And I want to finish up with this. When this all started back in the early 2000s, General, I had no idea I was going to be indicted. <laughs> but, I, but I was. So this became really personal for me. And the grand jury system became really personal to me about how it's abused. Erica Dockery in Houston, Texas, people like her, who basically were threatened with their children being taken away unless they didn't change their testimony, in her case, against her boyfriend. This lady, March the 2nd of this year, in a civil rights case in Houston, Texas, it was clearly shown where the district attorney's office knew about the information that would have clearly shown that her boyfriend couldn't have killed that police officer because he was asleep on the couch. But it was kept away from that grand jury. It was kept away. And those types of grand jury reforms in the states. We've got, to, we've got to be courageous to stand up and do. And Brooke and the Texas Public Policy Foundation, they were on the lead of that in Texas. And I'll promise you, Texas, we're going to be back. <laughs> we're going to be back in 2019. And we're going to talk about these criminal justice reforms in the states and at the federal level. And America is going to be a better place because of what Jared and Ivanka and people like Van and Topeka, I know you all have worked on together. I mean, God bless you. I'm in the fight. Let me, I'm going to add for just a minute. Woo! I want to add to, uh, to our great governor, uh, Secretary Perry. My name is Brooke Rollins, uh, as the governor mentioned, but I'll be joining uh, Jared and the Office of American Innovation and Ivanka at the White House in just two weeks' time. Give her a round my of applause great for that. That's well, a big deal. no, That's a big no, no. Deal. The governor told the great story of Texas, and governor, not to correct you, but we're now at eight prisons closed in Texas. But here's what's really, not two, but eight, but see, this is what happens, I know. But more importantly than that, the crime rate in Texas is down 30% since we've done that. Texas's population has doubled, exploded, because of our great job growth, thanks to a great leader. But, but, but as far as the prison reform system goes, we've closed down eight prisons. We have completely changed licensing laws and probation laws. Secretary Acosta, I know in Miami, you implemented the first veterans court in the, in the country. These things all make a tremendous difference, and we are a country of second chances, and we are a country of redemption, but we're also a country about public safety, and that's the beautiful thing about what we're trying to do, what we've done in the states, but now at the federal level what we're working to do is this will help decrease the crime rate and keep our communities safer so that's an important point too thank you thank you all well, for having me here well well said well said um i'll, I'll go, to, go to you uh last jessica uh, you and i get a chance to work together on your cut 50 campaign uh you are a democrat uh this is not a bipartisan moment o overall but on this issue that seems to be a little bit of a bipartisan thaw. Why do you think that Democrats should be working with Republicans on this? And what can we do to make sure that when people do come home, they come home and do well and, uh, and keep this momentum going? 
Well, first, thanks for having me here and, and giving us this opportunity. I am so excited to see this continued bipartisan effort, an improved bipartisan effort. It feels like it's gaining momentum on this issue. Um, I think for me, it's personal why we need to come together. Uh, when I was 22, my husband was sent to prison. I found myself standing in a courtroom holding our two-month-old daughter, uh, who's now who's quite a bit Anna, bigger. Right and there, the superstar. Introduced the vice president earlier. Uh, but at that time, you know, all I wanted was for my husband to come home. I didn't care if it was a Democrat that passed some policy or a Republican that passed some policy. And I remember once I started to learn about the system and learn how the political division was getting in the way of progress and ripping apart families across the country. All I wanted to do was see people reach across the aisle. We all know somebody who's been impacted by incarceration. Now maybe it's your best friend, maybe it's your husband, maybe it's yourself, maybe it's the guy down the street. We all know somebody who's been impacted by incarceration. We need to focus on empowering people who have been incarcerated to come home and be a part of the solution. Help us figure out how can we actually address some of the underlying reasons people are committing crime, mental illness, drug addiction, poverty. How can we use the voices of those who have been through the system to improve it? So you say, how can we start bringing people home and make our streets safer, which is, should be the goal for all of us? You know, we need to start by looking at what's really broken. When somebody comes home from prison, what is their current experience? In most states, they're given 50 bucks and a bus ticket and, and told, okay, good luck. I hope you do well. And this is after years of being inside of a prison where they probably are not getting the resources or the help they need to rehabilitate. So we need to start by having a real conversation about housing for people coming home from prison, about how do we get them jobs and how can we improve their lives as they're coming home and support them in succeeding? Very good. Well, first of all, give this uh, panel a round of applause. Um, I want to say a, a couple of things. Um, this isn't just for show. About half the people in this room were working this morning together in real working sessions trying to figure out how to solve real problems together. We're going to keep working together. And I just want to say, as a, as a proud Democrat and a strong progressive, um, both political parties have core values. For Republicans, liberty is a core value. Limited government, individual rights, that is a core value that's being, I think, challenged now with too much incarceration. And Democrats have a value around justice and making sure the little folks don't get mistreated. That value is getting run over too. If we can't get together for liberty and justice for all, if we can get together for liberty and justice for all, something's wrong with this country. We're gonna do something on this issue. We'll fight about everything else, but on this issue, let's get together. Thank you very much.